we can use mathematics and statistics to help us understand and possibly overcome some of these problems. I've listed there some of the papers I'm going to refer to. I'll just be going uh, quite quickly with making this as accessible as possible. But if you want to contact me, I'm very happy to give you uh, more references that you can follow up on these topics. And the main idea here is this um, idea of adversarial attacks. So somebody is deliberately trying to make things go wrong in the system. And from my perspective, that's to do with stability, that's vulnerability uh, with respect to perturbations. So those are the kinds of topics we'll be looking at. I'll say a little bit more shortly, um, but I'm sure many of you know of the basic idea uh, behind these deep learning neural networks. Uh, on the left, we have an image, typically red, green, blue pixel components. That gets passed through this pipeline. It's a mixture of linear and nonlinear operations. And by the time we come out at the other end, we have the output, which might be, for example, probabilities. So maybe you've got 100 different classes, and there's a probability that the input came from each particular class and then you might choose to classify according to the highest probability. So in this case, you'd hope that dog was the highest probability. These deep learning tools really came to the fore around uh, 2012. There was a, a, a very significant breakthrough with AlexNet, which won an important competition outperforming the standard tools of the day. That was a big surprise at the time because AlexNet involved a huge amount of parameterization. There were 60 million parameters that you had to fit to make this tool work. So the training aspect was significant. And at the time, it wasn't really understood that this would generate an effective tool. So optimizing over 60 million dimensions, uh, even now, is still pretty hard to imagine. But that's what was done. And very quickly, other tools became available of a similar nature with lots of parameters that you have to fit to make them work. And then not long after this, so this is around 2012, uh, 2014, a couple of papers came out. And here's an example from one of the papers, the first one. And th these are very good papers to read. They're classics in the area. They're full of good ideas. Um, so I recommend having a look at them if you're interested. This picture comes from the first paper. On the left, we have an example from the, uh, the data set, which is of a school bus. I hope we'd all agree. Then if you take that image in the middle, and this has been multiplied by a factor of 10, so all the pixels are 10 times their value, just so we can see something on the screen. Otherwise, it would really not, not appear. So 10 times um, the perturbation gives us what's on the right. And I hope you'll agree that looks like the same image. So we've made a very tiny perturbation to the image. As far as we're concerned, it's the same image. But the system now, one of these very sophisticated neural networks, now classifies this as an ostrich. So it gets the answer right in the first case on the left, but it gets the answer wrong when we make a tiny perturbation. And that's an example of what's called an adversarial attack. So it turns out these systems are vulnerable to perturbations in the inputs, even tiny perturbations. The paper that's written there, the first paper there, used the word intriguing in the title, uh, intriguing property of neural networks. I would say this is a disconcerting or terrifying property of neural networks, because they, they, they make a tiny, tiny change, and it gives a different answer. And that's an instability, in a sense, in the map. OK. And once that idea was out there, there was lots of scope for creativity. Um, the idea there was to make something imperceptible, but you can equally well make a perturbation which is only designed to attack the system. So a human being would recognize that the change has been made, but the automated system still classifies things incorrectly. So uh, this work is about patches. So you print out on a piece of paper a colorful patch, which has been carefully chosen. And the person who's wearing that patch around their neck is not recognized by this automated surveillance system. So the person on the left there is recognized as a human. The system puts a rectangle around them. But the person on the right, because they're wearing a patch, is not recognized as a human. So you can imagine the security implications of these mm -hmm. kinds of perturbations. 
So here we're not trying to fool the human, we're trying to fool the system. I should say that these are very specific perturbations. So this, this uh, gradient attack in the middle is not random. It's been, it's been carefully chosen to be the worst possible direction in which to make a change. So that's by using the gradients, uh, that are po the partial derivatives that are available within the system. Um, so that would be a, what's called a, a white box attack because we need to have access to what's inside the system to work out those gradients. But you can do a very similar black box attack if you're allowed to um, probe the system a few times, then you can approximate the gradients using uh, finite differences. So you can also do this kind of attack, even if you only have access to inputs and outputs. Um, there's another example people came up with where you just wear a pair of spectacles with appropriate colors on them, and the automatic facial recognition systems will then think that you're somebody else. So if you want to be a famous celebrity, you can just give yourself the appropriate pair of spectacles. And again, if you think of the way that facial recognition is potentially being used in law enforcement, for example, then this is a this is somewhat uh, disconcerting as an idea. And you can even go on to more recent models, these large language models, where you input text and the model responds. Uh, there's something called alignment, and the model the model is aligned if it agrees with the uh, the, the um, scope that it was given by the person who wrote it. In particular, um, you might want your model not to produce anything offensive um, or politically incorrect, um, or um, you know you might have certain rules that you want the model to adhere mm -hmm. to in terms of what it's prepared to tell you. Uh, maybe national security uh, is one of those uh, things that you want to preserve. So quite often you'll ask it a question. And the model will say, look, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to answer that question. Even though I can give you some information, I'm not allowed to. Well, it turns out you can get around that. If you just type in an appropriate extra set of characters, so it looks like complete gibberish, complete random set of characters, you're typing your question, type in some more characters that are very carefully chosen, and the model will then quite happily give you the answer. So here is, here's a recent paper where this was done. Um, you type in a, a question which is supposed to be uh, off limits to the model, but it will then happily give you an answer. There are other ways of doing this. You can also um, be a bit more um, careful about how you phrase the question. Maybe you say, my mother used to work in a nuclear power station. Can you tell me what my mother used to do? And because you've made it more of a story, uh, some of these models are more likely to give you information that way. But this is more of an algorithmic way of doing things by choosing an appropriate string of characters, again, optimizing in some way to try to force the model to do something which it wasn't supposed to do. And this is different to the previous case because with pixels, they're essentially continuous, so you can make small perturbations. Here, if you're adding characters to the string, then those are discrete perturbations. So in a sense, this is a more difficult problem, but some of the same techniques are still available. So here's a, a quote from one of the big names in this area, um, Nicholas Carlini, very recent piece of work. He said, if you go to the top computer science conferences, you'll see lots of examples of defenses. So algorithms and techniques which try to guard against these types of attacks. So either you identify that you're being attacked or you have an algorithm that can't be attacked in the first place. But despite publication of many of these defenses, typically within a couple of weeks, someone publishes a way around that defense. So the attack world always seems to be able to overcome the defense world. So there's a research game of cat and mouse going on uh, between defense and attack. And it does seem as though the attack world uh, always seems to get the upper hand so there's no guaranteed way to defend against these attacks at the moment. So this has caused uh, raised interest in many uh, areas, in particular governments and institutions are concerned about this. You know, and, uh, we're being told that AI should be regulated. A lot of that is to do with the idea that AI is so fantastic, it's going to be super intelligent and we should be worried about AI somehow coming and knocking on the door and taking over the world. 
But there's also the issue of this, if this stuff doesn't work as well as it should do, then we should also be careful about, about how we use it and, and where we embed it into our systems. So many people around the world, many governments, institutions are interested in regulation. And this goes all the way to the top. So in particular, the Pope has called for regulation of AI. So you know, everybody's interested. There's a recent paper I came across, which is more from my perspective, although this is just giving lots of case studies where things go wrong. Um, but these authors coined the phrase, the fallacy of AI functionality. So the fallacy, something we get wrong, is assuming that AI functions as it's supposed to. So before we even think about uh, what should AI be doing, we should be asking what can AI do in the first place? What are its limitations? I was a bit missed off there, but can we can we design regulations that are not violated by the mathematics? So some of the proposed regulations and the EU has something going through uh, at the moment. Some of those regulations say in high risk areas, uh, anything involving humans, for example, or security, the person or the, the system, the, 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 yeah, the people who write the AI system should be able to guarantee that this system works properly and um, does what it's supposed to do. And I'm going to show uh, shortly that there are some mathematical theorems that say in generality, uh, you can't do that. You, you can't design a system that's guaranteed to work. So we might be making laws which can't actually be upheld because mathematically they're impossible to hold, depending how you interpret the law, of course, um, that, that might happen. Has anybody looked at the, the EU AI regulations they came out a couple of years ago. I think they've now got quite far ahead and they've been uh, edited in various times, but it was surprising to me, there's a big document that came out and I wondered what they meant by AI. And the document then says, for a definition of AI, please see Annex 1. And then you go to Annex 1 and Annex 1 is an inexhaustive list. So AI includes the following. It doesn't, it's not meant to be exhaustive and it includes statistics, optimization, so anything you do on a computer seems to be called AI in that first draft of the document. So when we're making regulations, it isn't even clear what it is we're regulating. And some of these regulations might be so broadly defined that they cover the whole of uh, scientific computation. So there's definitely issues here. And I think people with a maths and stats and computing background need to be involved just to make sure these regulations make some sort of sense. So here's a bit more detail. I'm going to focus on standard feed forward neural networks. Um, I'm sure many of you have come across this. So ultimately it's a map. It takes an input, in our case, the vector of pixel values, possibly red, green, and blue, all made into one big vector. And it turns out at the other end, a set of probabilities, classification probabilities. So it's just some general nonlinear map. It's defined iteratively. So we start off with the input X, and then at each layer, we first of all multiply the previous layer's output by a matrix W, add a bias vector B, and then we apply a nonlinearity. That sigma L is a nonlinear, typically sigmoidal type function applied component wise uh, to each uh, component of the vector. So we're just iterating with a linear and then a nonlinear map. And by the time we finish, we have the output. What about stability? How susceptible is that map to perturbations? Well, you can look at that in terms of the Jacobian or the gradient of, of the map. Okay, so partial derivatives tell us how things change subject to small perturbations. And simple calculus allows you to work out uh, those partial derivatives. And you find you get the product of the weight matrices W and these diagonal matrices D, which um, which are um, based on what's coming out of each layer and um, the derivative of the nonlinearities. So that's just basic calculus. The size of that matrix of partial derivatives tells us something about sensitivity of the, the output relative to the input. Mm -hmm. So there's a reminder at the top. And one thing you can do, which was done quite early on when these people uh, in AI were looking at sensitivity, one thing you do is just take norms. So on the left there in that inequality, that's the, the change in the output when you change from X to Y in the input. 
So how much can the output change relative to x minus y on the right-hand side? So that factor there in the round brackets, you can think of as the amplification factor or the condition number or the Lipschitz constant of the map. And if we could control that, for example, making that less than one would mean that a, a change in the input has no bigger change in the output. There's no amplification uh, in the appropriate norm, which in this case is the two norm. So that was done in, in a very early research paper in this area. When they were training the networks, they made sure that their weight matrices had norms less than one. And if you use sigmoids, then the sigma, the nonlinearities, have Lipschitz constants less than one. So under that restriction on the training, you have what's what they call passable networks, which were guaranteed to be stable in the sense that a small perturbation to the input can only make a small perturbation to the output. And hopefully that will not change the classification unless you're very close to a decision boundary. That was done and those networks, you know, were shown to, to work effectively in, in some context. I would say you're controlling the condition number in that sense. But I'm going to mention shortly some other work and more technical theoretical work, which shows that this cannot possibly work in general. So if you're allowed to choose a data set yourself, you can always find the data set where the network is not stable. So this is not guaranteed uh, to work. That's if you want accuracy. So an, an, accurate, an accurate network on this data set is guaranteed to be unstable. That's the, that's the results that somebody proved. So I'll come back to that shortly. So this is a somewhat heuristic approach that's not guaranteed to work. Okay, so I'll move on to a, a particular type of attack that I've worked on with a student just to show some of the creativity ideas you can use in this field. And this was motivated by uh, my background in numerical analysis. So we have this concept of backward error. If you're solving an applied maths problem on a computer, um, suppose the problem, again, I'm using the same notation F. So given some input X, maybe you're solving a differential equation, maybe you're computing some important quantity, and that important quantity is y. So a nonlinear map f, you're approximating it with a numerical method and coming up with an output. Then you can talk about the forward error, which is how close your computed output y is to the required exact output y. But you can also talk about the backward error, which is given that I've computed this quantity, which might be an error, maybe there's discretization error or floating point rounding error you might be concerned about, so we've computed y hat, and we should have computed y. You can ask, well, what's the smallest change to the input which causes us uh, to get y hat in the exact map? So how much do I have to change the data to make what I've computed become the correct answer? So we, we're making the we're putting the error on the data input data rather than the output. What's the smallest change to the problem specification for which we've computed the right answer? This turns out to be very useful in numerical analysis because we can often prove things about the backward error being small when we can't guarantee the forward error is small. So you can say to the engineer, we, we haven't got the right answer. We can't guarantee that. We haven't got close to the right answer, but what we have got solves a nearby problem. So if, given that the data is often uncertain, we're within that uncertainty range, we've got an answer which, which corresponds to a reasonable specification of the problem. So that's the backward error idea, but that's almost the same as adversarial attack. And we're thinking y hat now as being our required new output, which gives us a different classification. So what's the smallest change x to the input, which causes a different classification? So it's almost the same optimization problem as we had uh, in this backward error world. But these authors had this they spotted this connection in 2021 and they came up with this algorithm so the idea now is to is to is to have a new target y hat so maybe you want to change the school bus into an ostrich and find the smallest delta x smallest change to the image which causes the network now to map x plus delta x into y hat and the clever idea they had was to then optimize over all y hat. So if you if you just wanted, for example, just to change the image to something else, then you could optimize that problem over all y hats, which give a different classification. 
So the index where y hat is maximum is different to the index where y is maximum. So the classification changes. And to make this feasible, you can argue that we're looking at small perturbations. So delta x is small, so we're okay to linearize the problem. So rather than f of x plus delta x minus f of x, we can linearize, just take the first term in the Taylor series, and then that becomes linear in delta x. But if you make that approximation, then this problem becomes feasible. It becomes a linearly constrained least squares problem. And there are standard software tools that allow you to solve those problems accurately. So that's what they did. Um, they didn't They didn't quite do that. They actually took lots of little steps and this became part of a bigger iteration. But this is the basic idea. Um, when we use their algorithm, this is with a PhD student, Lucas, um, we looked at this, this technique. So here we're comparing three different attack methods um, on a very simple network on what's called the MNIST data. I'm sure many of you heard of the MNIST data. It's a set of handwritten digits. It's the first thing we ever try when we're doing classification. Um, so you can get good accuracy very easily on this data set. So we have a, a network that's accurate. What I'm showing here is the proportion of attacks that required at least an amount epsilon, a, a relative chain, so delta x over x in two norm. So on the horizontal axis, this is how much we perturbed the image. And the vertical axis says what proportion of the test sets we were able to attack successfully. So if I move across here, um, with around 0.1, so with a 10% with change to the image, you can attack around half, half the training set. Um, so half the images can be attacked with a 10% change. And these are three um, different algorithms. Um, PGDL2 and Deep Tool are standard algorithms built into PyTorch. And L2 here is the one I just described. Uh, lower is better in this picture. So this backward arrow version is at least as good as the standard algorithm. It's very similar, uh, does something at least as effective as the standard algorithms. So we took that idea and looked at another way of measuring perturbations. So this is based on some old work. So even before I met Natasha, this goes back even further than that, uh, 1992, we had this idea of component-wise measures. So instead of measuring the norm of delta x and looking comparing that with the norm of the image x, let's look at each component separately. So this notation here means that these are vectors and the inequality has to hold for every component simultaneously. So every component of delta x must be less than or equal to epsilon times every component in some reference vector f. So that's how we're measuring perturbation, the smallest component-wise change we make. Then we can do the same trick, uh, choose a new output y hat, and look for the smallest delta x, which causes y hat to be the output. And again, optimize over all the ones that change classification. What might be surprising is that after, you, after you've linearized, you can also cast this problem in the same format. So it's still a linearly constrained least squares problem. So we can apply the same tools and find the best perturbation in this sense. We're going to take f equal to x. So our reference vector is the image itself. So that means that for every pixel in the image, we're allowed to perturb it relative to its current value. So looking component-wise along all the pixels, uh, essentially putting a mask on, if you like, and um, each of component-wise perturbation. Um, in particular, if you have a background with zero values for the pixels, then those zero values can't change. You can't change and you can't change a zero to a non-zero. And if it's a small number, then you can't change it very much. So this is relevant to handwritten uh, text, for example. Um, if there's a white background, we're not allowed to change the white background according to this constraint. So I'll show an example. Um, this is an, an MNIST image, again, using that network, which is relatively accurate. Um, the original image is on the left. If you apply one of these standard uh, uh, um, algorithms built into PyTorch, Deep Fool, then this essentially finds the smallest L2 norm perturbation. 
So the, the delta x is the smallest one in L2 norm. But you can see some of the white pixels have been changed into black. So it looks a bit smudgy, and you might be a bit suspicious if you saw that image. On the right, we've used this component-wise attack where we're only allowed to change the non-zeros. So the, the, the higher the pixel value, the more we're allowed to change it. And you can see we have something that still looks like a seven. So both of those images in the middle and on the right are classified as eight, so they're misclassified. But the middle image has a smudgy, smeared background, whereas the one on the right, I think, is more convincing. It looks, it looks as though the pen wasn't very consistent, or the ink has been missed off a little bit. Um, in terms of two norm, you know, deep fool is essentially optimal. So deep fool is a small, smaller two norm change. Uh, this component-wise version is a bigger change in the two norm, but still, in a, in a well-defined sense, I think it's just it's a less obvious perturbation. And if you think of numbers on a check, those of you who remember writing checks on pieces of paper, if you write a check for $100, you hope the system identifies those digits as $100. Or if you sign a document, or if you write the date on a, on a, on a legal document, you'd hope that the date is correctly interpreted and if that's you know, automatically processed. Whereas you know, some relatively minor changes can, can cause misclassifications. So I think this is an issue. Uh, my PhD student, Lucas, also has now moved on uh, to optical character recognition. So here we're, we're analyzing handwritten strings, so sentences, if you like. Handwritten sentences get scanned in, sent to the computer, and the computer is asked to interpret that handwritten sentence. Um, here we, we're looking at transformer technology. This is the cutting edge technology for doing optimal character recognition. So it doesn't just go uh, letter by letter. This technology looks at the whole sentence. It knows what's been before. It has some sense of how language uh, is used. It has, in a sense, it knows about vowels and nouns and you know, prefixes and suffixes. So that, you know, it's, it's not just looking letter by letter. It's somehow trying to capture the whole sentence. And it's amazingly impressive how it can do this. Um, at least on the on the training sets and the test sets that are used. So my student wrote himself on a piece of paper this version of the first law of robotics and scanned it in. And this very sophisticated system came up with the correct interpretation. A robot may not injure a human being. Okay, we then decided to attack this, a targeted attack where we're trying to change to a particular output. There's the output at the bottom. It's still, um, actually, this is the big reveal here is missed off. Um, can I get rid of this stuff at the bottom anyway? Can I get rid of these names? No. <laughs> I'll, I'll try. It's missing the big bit here. Can I maybe can move them? Yeah. There. Um, no. Can anybody come and have a go for me? This is the best bit of the talk, I can show you. Just put it to the side of the top. Let's see. Help. <laughs> Estuve trabajo con Bob y no sé cómo, no sé, no me defiendo con estos teclados. Va a ocultar para. Uy, pero eso es otro. Suscrito. Right, close your eyes for a minute. <laughs> Lost the page down there. Yeah. I've lost the ability to change pages. Yeah. Hello, can you? Yeah. Yes, that's it. Great. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so 
re rewinding to where I was, we have this little perturbation in the middle there, which you can barely see, and that's that's multiplied by a factor of ten. So the, you know, there is a there's a certain amount of grey. It seems to follow the edges of the of the lettering, which is just what we computed by optimizing. Um, that's the attack image, which looks the same, but we've now made it so that the output is a robot may now injure a human being. Okay. So that's what we aim for. So the word not has changed the word now. We didn't just attack the T, we had to attack the whole image there. So it's, it's quite a lot of coding went into this, understanding all these different bits of the, um, the transformer model. But Lucas managed to get that to work, found the partial derivatives and did the appropriate attack. Um, so I think that's a bit scary that you can, you can change the meaning of a sentence with a essentially imperceptible perturbation. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about inevitability. So taking a step back, these attacks seem to be successful most of the time. What can we ever prove about the stability of these systems? What are the limitations? So we're now going to talk about some mathematical results. To prove these results, we have to make assumptions. So keep that in mind that all these theorems come with a list of conditions under which the result holds. And whether those conditions are reasonable or not is a matter for debate. And this is still a very early area of research. So we're hoping to make the assumptions more realistic as we go along. Also, you know, if you can test these assumptions and maybe you can show that they don't hold, maybe that's a positive thing to do. You know, these negative results might not hold in your particular application or for your particular data set. So all this adds to the understanding, I think, of the, of the systems. Um, here, the paper at the top there is the one that got us into this area. Um, this was essentially showing that in very high dimension, so a very high input dimension, uh, it's almost guaranteed that there'll be a small perturbation that changes the classification. Okay. Using high dimensional analysis, so in, in this case, they use the isoperimetric inequalities, which concerns the ratio of surface area to volume in very high dimensional balls. Um, high dimension is incredibly counterintuitive. All sorts of weird things happen if you let the dimension go to infinity. Um, so stuff that you think is obvious no longer holds. Um, surface areas become very close to volumes of the next dimension um, in this world. So they're essentially showing that a randomly chosen data point is guaranteed to be close to a decision boundary. So there's always somewhere nearby with a different classification. Uh, with, with some colleagues at the uh, bottom there, we also worked on that problem. Um, the, middle, the middle paper there, uh, from the Cambridge group, they looked at specifically at neural networks and they showed these surprising results that they can, if you give them a network, they can find a data set. And it's a well well defined data set. It, they're not they're not cheating by having two points very close together with different labels. That that would be a cheat. So these are well separated uh, training a set of well separated data for training. Um, Given the network, they can find the data set for which your network is guaranteed either to be inaccurate or unstable. Okay, so you can't have accuracy and stability at the same time. It's impossible. We have to have a trade off. Uh, that's if you let these people choose the training set. Okay, so in that world, there's no, uh, no guarantee of accuracy and stability. Um, we did some similar work um, in that bottom paper. Um, here we're showing that. Again, we're allowed to choose the data sets, and we can show um, that for this particular training set with labels, you can't have um, that, that. Sorry, there's one network which is accurate and stable, but there's one arbitrarily close by in terms of the weights and biases, um, which is accurate but unstable. So you never know which one of those you're going to get. And they're both accurate. One is fine, and one is not fine. And which one you're going to get? So they're arbitrarily close together. So no optimization algorithm can guarantee to find the better one. So these are all little games that mathematicians can play if you let them choose the data set. Um, here's another piece of work we did recently, looking at some of the properties of these adversarial attacks, which have been reported empirically um, in, the, in the literature. So here's an example just to show one of the properties that we, um, the experiment we did. This is on an image set, CFAR. 
So these are low resolution images from different categories. Um, we set up binary tests. So for each experiment, we just took two of the categories and tried to convert from an image in one category and get it misclassified into the other category. So it might be cats to aeroplanes. So take images of cats, try to make them become predicted as aeroplanes. So lots of those pairwise and binary experiments we did. Um, we're using a, an accurate um, neural network here. On the left is what you get when you do a gradient-based attack. So you use optimization to find the, the worst possible direction in which to make the perturbation. And we're showing success. So here's the fraction of images from the set which get mis gets misclassified. And here's the size of the perturbation. So um, with a 10% with a perturbation, you can misclassify around 40% of the images. And with a 20%, you can misclassify 70% uh, or so. Here's an example of around um, maybe 0.18. So this is the original image. So these are low resolution images. And this type of perturbation is enough to cause it to get misclassified. So that's using the best attack in terms of gradients. Here we're using random attacks. So we take 200 random changes to the image. Each, each pixel is just randomly perturbed, so no gradient information, and it's much harder to make a change. So on this axis, uh, well, we're giving three curves here, four curves, but only two of them are non-zero. So green is where you take five times as much as the best gradient attack. So whatever gradient attack worked on the image, we now take random, random perturbations, which are five times as big on those images, and we can only change a small percentage of the of the uh, of the set. And even with ten times ten times the size, you still get relatively poor uh, performance in terms of success of the attacks. So random doesn't work. This is this is a random perturbation that works, but you can tell straight away that it's changed. There's almost nothing left of the image. Whereas with a gradient attack, you know, we're, we're, we're sufficiently small that we're still keeping. The sense of the image there. Okay, so random doesn't work. That's something that's been widely observed. And here's a list of things that, that get reported about um, um, uh, adversarial attacks. So we can build classifiers which are accurate on the test and training data. It seems inevitable that attacks exist and they can be computed using gradients. Um, perturbing at random doesn't work, much less effective. What's also been observed is that um, for images of the same class, the perturbation that works on one of them will also work on another, typically. So the delta x can be transferred to other images and still does a reasonable job of causing the misclassification. And also, for a totally different neural network architecture, often the same delta x will be successful. So there's a sort of universality both across images themselves and across neural network architectures. If you can find a good delta X, it will work in other circumstances. So we, we managed to come up with a mathematical world where each of these six properties hold. So we're, we're trying to argue this might explain where these properties come from. Of course, we're only overlapping. We're not guaranteeing this is why, but we're coming up with a world where these six properties hold. Um, I'll just briefly talk through that. Um, so this is just to give you a feel for the type of assumptions we have to make to prove things at the moment. Um, we're looking at a world where the data comes from two unit balls, Euclidean unit balls in Rn. Um, this is the 2D case. So they're, they're perturbed by an amount epsilon from the origin along one coordinate direction. So on the left, Anything we sample from that ball is given one label, say zero, and we sample from the other ball half the time, and that gets labeled one. So equally likely to get samples from each ball, and depending which ball we sample from, we give it the appropriate label. We're thinking of epsilon being small here. So that's the that's where the data comes from with its labels. Um, because of concentration of measure effects, the linear separator does a good job. 
So even though there seems to be a big overlap here, because of this high dimensional uh, weird effects going on, the linear separator based on the first component gives you a very accurate classifier. And then we can prove things, prove those six properties hold with high probability. So I should say, what we're proving now depends on a certain game you have to play. And the game is that you give me epsilon, and epsilon is going to determine the size of the perturbation that I'm allowed. So you can make epsilon as small as you like, you can be as nasty as you like, give me a tiny, tiny epsilon. I'm allowed to make only perturbations of size epsilon. But I'm allowed to choose n, which is the dimension of the input. Okay, so epsilon comes first, and then I, I'm allowed to go away and choose n as big as I like. Which, if you think of images, are millions of pixels. It's not such a dramatic assumption in some sense. Okay, so given epsilon, we're going to think of perturbations of size delta, and delta can be you know, almost as small as epsilon here. Then the kind of result we can prove, this is the inevitability result, a randomly sampled point can be attacked successfully with a norm size delta perturbation. So just slightly bigger than your epsilon, there's a successful attack with this probability. And this probability tends to one exponentially as n goes to infinity. So I can make this arbitrarily close to one, we fixed epsilon, delta is a tiny bit bigger, and I can now let n go to infinity, and this gets arbitrarily close to one. So that's a, a sense in which it's inevitable that a randomly chosen data point will be susceptible to attack. Now, that, that's a very simplistic world. I'm not saying that real data looks like that. Perhaps the biggest assumption here is that the data lives in a unit four, Euclidean norm one, in high dimension. I think the norm one is reasonable because the pixels are usually constrained, but whether they're uniformly sampled from that unit four is the question. If you think of images, you know, just because your camera has twice as many pixels next time you upgrade it, it doesn't mean that image space of re real world images is twice as big. Um, so what is the actual dimension of images compared to the number of pixels that you're looking at? Maybe images live on a much lower dimensional manifold. So that's something that could be tested and some people are looking at that. You know, so does it make sense to allow yourself to go to arbitrarily high dimension or is there some limits um, where real data lives? Okay. Um, so here's the final topic I wanted to mention. This is another type of attack that we came up with, uh, which might seem a bit wacky at the, uh, to begin with. So we, we're going to allow ourselves to go in and change the weights of the um, of the weights that live in the architecture of a neural network. So we can change entries in the neurons. Change to quickly change one neuron. We're going to do. Why is that useful? Well, you know, there may be someone in the development team who is mischievous or criminal. They want to bury uh, bury this inside without changing the structure of the code. They want to go in there and just change one number in all these parameters and make the code do something specific that, that benefits them or their boss. Um, there's also this idea that we should be sharing our networks. In particular, the big AI companies, they have all the resources and all the data. They build these massive tools and they very kindly sometimes let other people use these networks and maybe build on top of them. But if you've inherited a network from somebody else, how do you know they haven't buried inside uh, some little Easter egg, some little uh, change of a parameter which causes the code to do something, something that's very hard to detect. But even though the structure makes perfect sense, it's still just a neural network, maybe one of those neurons has been set up to do something very specific uh, on a, one particular piece of data. Okay, so it's just an interesting question, um, which in principle might be useful. Also, there's the watermarking idea. If you wanted to if you were scared of other people getting hold of your network, how could you prove that you're the person that spent all, the, all that money and resource training it? Well, you can maybe prove by burying something inside uh, that causes it to do something specific. So you can, you can show, here's what, it's, here's what I did uh, to guarantee that it's my network. Okay, so why might this work? So here's a couple of insights um, into why this idea uh, might work. 
So these are my uh, colleagues, uh, Ivan and Alexander, had this amazing result on another high dimensional property. Um, this is to do with the convex hull. So if you, if you sample a very large number of independent vectors in high dimension, then with probability very close to one, each of those points that you sample will be the vertex of the convex hull of the set. So what that means is that every single point that you've generated, every single vector, can be separated by a hyperplane from the rest. Okay. So there's a linear separator, which will, for every single point, there's a linear separator, which will separate that one from the others. So for example, in, in dimension 100, so vectors with 100 components, you can take roughly 3 million, 3 million of them, and each one will be separable from the others with very high probability, more than 0.99. It's very hard for me to intuitively imagine that, but that's that's true. And they have this really clever idea that you can use this to fix AI systems. So if you've built this very expensive model, maybe you're trying to recognize characters, you know, uh, transport vehicles in a, in a video surveillance system. Suppose it's working fine, then it goes wrong on one particular uh, data point, one particular image, uh, it doesn't get right, then you can simply add a neuron to your network. And that neuron can be made so that it doesn't fire on all the previous data you've seen. So all the 3 million minus 1 points, it still doesn't fire because as a, the neuron corresponds to a hyperplane. So it doesn't fire on the previous data, so everything still works. But on this new data point, make sure that neuron does fire and then make sure it fixes the problem. So you know, for a small number of problems, you can simply add a small number of neurons and make them fire at the appropriate time, and that will fix the system. So it's an on-the-fly way of fixing neural networks with a small number of problems arising. But in the same way, you could add a neuron that never fires and make it fire once on a new data point and make it do something terrible. So that's what we thought of for the stealth attack. Okay, the other insight is this idea of network pruning. So these networks, you know, 60 million parameters is way too many. We don't need 60 million parameters in our models. Now, this is well recognized. And it turns out you can just throw away lots of those parameters and have a model which works just as well. So this is called pruning. Um, it's a, a way to improve efficiency when you're running the network, make it into a smaller uh, computational task so it runs more quickly when you're doing your predictions. Um, so here's a typical result. Um, in a certain circumstance, um, with more than 100 neurons in the network, you can throw away 99% of your parameters and still get something which, um, compared to the original network, has a small error. So if you have a large number D of neurons and you throw away 99% of them, you're making a relatively small change. Thinking of the network as a function, uh, the functional norm doesn't change very much. So there's a well-defined sense in which we can throw neurons away, or we can argue that most of the neurons are redundant. We're not doing very much. Okay, so here's the framework we put in. Imagine somebody owns the network. They also have a secret validation set or set of test data. And when they're testing their network, they check, they check it on that validation set, make sure the output's what it should be. There's an attacker who's going to come in and change one neuron in the network. And after they've made the change, we have this compromised system. But on the test set, the compromised system does exactly the same job it did before. It's just, almost it's the same, but on this particular trigger input, um, the system now does something different that the attacker wants. Okay? So I know Natasha travels first class when she's flying, but if, if I'm if I go to the airport, I show them my passport, um, and I want to come up as a premium member of British Airways. So when it sees my passport photo, that's the trigger, and I'm regarded as a premium member of British Airways. Whereas all the other passport photos that have ever been looked at, they still come out with the same answer. Okay, so there's a particular input, and the system's now compromised, and it produces the output that the attacker wants just by changing the neuron. And, and again, under appropriate conditions, we can actually prove that this is going to work. So um, 
something that successful changes the output on the trigger, not on the rest of the test set. We have a way of adding a neuron. And under the appropriate assumptions, we have the chance of success has this kind of probability, bounded below by one minus something constant, depending on, for example, the size of the validation set. But there's a number less than one gamma raised to the power n. So this tends to one as dimension goes to infinity. So again, the, the chance of success is tending to one in the high dimension. And we've confirmed this with experiments. Um, this is adding a neuron. If you wanted to rewire the neuron, so go in and just change the number, then this does work in practice. We don't have the corresponding theory uh, for that version of the algorithm, but we, we do have success in practice for that. So let me just wrap up. What we're looking at here is essentially stability. So when things go wrong, when you make perturbations, um, I focused on high dimension. But if you if things really do live in high dimension, the data does, then these these concerns are valid. I think um, we can also exploit the fact that these networks are overparameterized by burying things inside them. One thing I haven't mentioned today, which is also a concern of mine, is the level of floating point accuracy that's being used in these computations. Has anybody come across Google's B float? So IEEE that I'm familiar with has double precision giving you 16 digits. You can use single precision, eight digits, you can use half precision, and B float tries to tries to avoid overflows and underflows by giving you a bigger range, but even smaller precision. So B float is about three digits accuracy per, per floating point operation. So if you're doing billions of you know multiplies, adds, takeaways, divides, each of one is each one is to three digits accuracy, then what can you possibly say about the answer? Okay. Any sensible analysis, it just doesn't work. You know, the error is going to be bigger than the thing you've computed. So, okay. so I'm, I'm not saying these tools don't work. I'm just saying we don't understand why they work. Because writing down mathematical expressions like matrix times vector is completely meaningless if what you're computing is that plus noise, which is bigger than what you've written down. So there's a huge world here of trying to understand why these things work. The computer scientists told me they weren't worried. They said, they could round every single individual floating point operation to zero or one, and these methods still work. So that's fine, you know, that's, that's great, but that's not what we're talking about. That's not what we're analyzing. So if you're going to do that, you know, at least write down what you're doing uh, and try to understand what's there. So there's a lot to be done here in terms of you know, trying to explain you know, why incredibly large scale computations at very, very low precision can mean anything. That's a, that's a useful question to ask. So I think from my perspective, people in my world, mathematics and statistics and theoretical computer science, uh, we can certainly devise new algorithms for attacking. That's the sort of the easy bit because attacks are tend to be uh, successful. Um, we can prove things about inevitability under appropriate assumptions. Um, and essentially it's about a trade-off, accuracy versus stability. What, what compromise do we need uh, uh, to, to get results? Um, and th this has all been quite negative in a way, but as I said earlier, if we can understand what goes wrong, maybe we can uh, try to fix things or at least explain that in certain circumstances, we don't have these, the conditions under which things go wrong. So we might be able to at least indirectly prove that um, things are not as bad as they seem. Um, and of course, the regulation aspect is not just about the maths and the stats. You know, when we talk about regulation, we need to involve all sorts of disciplines. So there's, there's legalities, there's philosophy, ethics. So there's certainly a big debate going on, but I think technical people should be involved in those debates. We can make contributions. Uh, in particular, we can talk about the limitations of some of these tools before we start to talk about how they, how they should be used. Okay, so I'll finish there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dad, for this fascinating talk. I think this is much needed in the community. So we have uh, some time for a few questions, probably not too many, because we have the defense of Alexandra Zeno starting in 15 minutes at UPC, but we can take maybe a couple of questions. 
Well, that, yeah, that's a very good question. And as I said, ideas have been published. And one idea which seems to work well is adversarial training. So when you're training your network, you give it the training image, update the network parameters, but then you give it an adversarially perturbed version of that, but give it the correct label, make sure it works correctly on this adversarially perturbed image. So you're sort of forcing it to correctly label something that's been attacked. So, and, and there's a clever way of doing that that's not so expensive. So you can build, you can essentially add adversarial images to your training data, make sure it works correctly on those images. And that seems to work, but of course, there could be some other way of adversarial perturbing that the system doesn't know about. And some of these theorems are generic, you know, that the Cambridge group say, do whatever you like, and once you've finished, give me the network. And whatever you give me, I can mess up. So in, in from that, that perspective, nothing you can do. You have to finish up with a network in the end. Whatever you finish up with is subject to these theorems. But the only the only around it is for those conditions not to hold. So um you want to have to know all possible adversarial attacks. Yes, attack. yes, um, yeah. Or you might you might say, my world, I'm only ever going to use this system in this world here where the train data has this form, and maybe that's much safer. Maybe it's low dimensional data that you're using. You know, so there's all sorts of stuff you can think about, but it's difficult to prove uh, positive results in this area. Any other questions? Um, there, are some questions online. there are some questions online. Okay, how do we get to them? See, chat, or do people just want to ask, unmute themselves? Or oh, okay, here we sure. are. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Let Let's just do that rather than reading this. Yes. Okay. Please let. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I'm Cedric. Uh, great talk. Uh, very, very interesting. Thank you. Um, um, isn't that strange on the example of the uh, character recognition OCR uh, example for uh, perturbation that you mentioned, that only one particular T in a robot may not ensure a human being was affected? Um it's not strange because we that was the target. We wanted to change. So they, they have this idea of keys and not is a key that the system has identified. We wanted to change that key into another key. So we, okay. we, we targeted that, that very specifically. Um, okay, I, I didn't realize that uh, you could do this in a contextualized way and that OCR was actually uh, pointing to every individual character in its context and not um, generically as a T in general. Okay. But yeah, it's not quite characters. OCR decides on what the chunks are. The chunks are called keys. And in this case, it decided that NOT was one key. And then we changed it to NOW in our attack. Okay, thank you. And the second question and last one is, um, how would those perturbative attacks on pixel-centric examples uh, that you mentioned in the first half um, translate in the in the realm of uh, high dimensional vector spaces um, uh, that we commonly extract from uh, for contextualized semantic features in human language. Uh, is there something equivalent to those pixel uh, centric uh, approaches that you described for attack uh, in um, semantic vector space for large language models, for instance? Um, I, I imagine there will be. And you know, this is a very fast moving area. So people are now attacking large language models just this last 12 months or so. Um, so it's not my world really, but I'm sure the same ideas apply. Also, a couple of the papers I mentioned, they're not about neural networks, they're about any classification. So the, the one on isoparametric inequalities was for a general classifier. So as long as you have more than one class and they're not degenerate, so anything that tries to split the unit ball into two sensible chunks, is, is subject to these vulnerabilities in high dimension. So, you know, in that sense, this is a generic problem. Classification is impossible in high dimension. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Maybe Sam? Yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, if you think like simpler models like 
for instance, a logistic regression or something like that. Yeah. Are they, do they tend to be open to less vulnerabilities or are they vulnerable in more predictable ways? Yeah, I think intuitively a simpler model is less vulnerable. But like I said, some of these theorems are just for any, the, the, yeah, the yeah. task of classifying is hard. Um, yeah. And the world I mentioned with the simple two ball model, yeah. anything would anything would fall foul of that. You know, yeah. That would work for any classification task and uh, the tool. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess your, your stealth attack, for instance, would be hard. To yes, the stealth attack wouldn't work, yeah, certainly. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, high accuracy is a is an issue here. So if yeah. you will do one main model that uh, that are more resilient to, to attacks, yeah. uh, just lowering your standard to like that Yes. Yes, and well, trivially, if your model predicts the same class all the time for everything, then it's completely stable. So it's trivial, but true. There are there exist stable models, but they're completely useless. And what is the compromise? Is is the is the question? Yeah. Okay. Any other question from online? Maybe the last one. If you have, guys, just speak up. Uh, hi, it's Jose Maria Fernandez. Uh, I have a couple of questions uh, which are not. Uh, so focused on the on the technique, uh, but uh, curious about uh, whether it, these techniques uh, have been used not for the evil purposes, but others like uh, introducing uh, watermarks in uh, publications. Uh, for instance, uh, when you have a rasterized text and uh, and the editor wants to to add some kind of watermark, uh, which appears uh, when the character recognition is applied or in an image uh, where some hidden uh, watermark is there so it can be located uh, in order to tell, well, uh, this is not the, the right use of this image. And the other question is also focused on uh, whether these techniques uh, have been applied uh, to a speech recognition so the neural networks used for a speech recognition have uh, uh, misunderstood uh, what it is listened, but uh, a human uh, uh, is able to understand it. Okay, yeah, so with the watermarking, what I'm familiar with is is watermarking the network itself. Uh, watermarking images, I think, has been done. I think Google, one of their AI, generative AI tools, claimed that they would watermark it so that you, you could be sure that you were, you know, you could be clear about whether something was generated by AI or generated by human. But I think there are issues there. You can, you know, you can overcome the watermarking, I think, fairly easily. Um, the second question, yes, people have attacked speech generation. And that, in a sense, that's easy. You can add very, very high or low frequency stuff that the human ear can't can't um, you know, interpret. And so that's a relatively easy task if, if you're prepared to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Oh. Very nice question. Uh, very nice talk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. I think we have to end here. Uh, thank you, Des. Yeah, you know, there's, there's